Hi everyone, it's Nicole here. I'll be talking about career counseling theory throughout these series of videos. I've broken it up to try to make it a little bit easier to digest. So uh, we'll just have about five or so slides at a time and um, then you'll be, we'll be working in order though. So ideally you'll start with the beginning lectures and then continue throughout. So a person's occupation impacts almost every aspect of their life, from how much money they make, where they live, the amount of free time they have, and even who they meet. Further, the work of Kahn and his colleagues in 2006 show that having an unchallenging job may lead to loss of intellectual skills. With this study in mind, I think it's apparent how important the work of a career counselor is. As career counselors, we may even be helping individuals with xetophobia, or a fear of the decision-making process. So it's our job to understand the potential developmental stages and techniques that can be beneficial in working with individuals. So let's dive in with a few terms, and just bear with me for the terms, but uh, the term career refers to how individuals see themselves in relationship to what they do. Career development is a sequence of choices and transitions made over the lifespan that's related to their career. Life course is the meaning sociologists inscribe on career when they define it as a sequence of occupations in the life of an individual. Social roles are the duties and rewards a culture assigns and ascribes to its members based on variables such as gender and race. Life space denotes the collection of social roles enacted by an individual as well as the cultural theaters in which these roles are played. And self-concept is a collection of perceptions that are integrated and coherent. So the role of a career counselor is to assist individuals so that they can make informed career choices and transitions. Many career counselors agree that in order to be effective, they need to know the principal employment opportunities that are currently available in their local area for college graduate employment opportunities, and they need to have a much larger geographic area if they are looking for college graduates than for high school graduates. They need to visit employers to learn information about the occupations, and they need to know where they can go to help clients access this information. So some limitations of career choice and career development theories include each theorist viewing career choice and development from a different perspective and focusing on specific selected aspects. No one theorist presents a comprehensive picture of all career things, but rather leaves it to us, the practitioners, to find ways to pull all this information together and put the various pieces of the puzzle together. Much of the research in the past has been conducted with white males from middle class uh, groups, so minority groups and people from diverse ethnic backgrounds have typically been underrepresented in much of the developmental theories of career counseling. Career developmental theory and practice are based on the culture of a specific country, typically the U.S., so we need to be thoughtful about how well these theories and techniques can be translated to those who are from other countries and cultures without all of that research. The assumption of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that we are all motivated by needs. We must satisfy each need in order and uh, we must start those with the needs of survival and move up um, to, and those are the lower needs, such as physical, emotional well-being, 
uh, we move up to those physical, the emotional well-being. So we can then and only then be concerned with the higher order needs that are related to personal development. So um, that was the original traditional belief about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but now throughout time we're realizing that you don't have to have all of your physiological needs met. Uh, in the U.S., you may have like 70% of your or 90% of your physiological needs, and then your safety needs may be more like 70, and your love and belonging, maybe that's 60, and your esteem, maybe that's 40, and self-actualization might be like 10. Um, so you could have some of your needs fulfilled on the hierarchy without all of them. We're beginning to believe that now. We didn't used to believe that. Um, but obviously our jobs impact our most basic human needs of food, shelter, clothing, safety. But we also have other needs related to work roles such as love and belonging. And most of us have a, a feeling and a need to be a part of some sort of team environment or um, kind of cohort of people almost. And um, also on the fourth level, we often achieve status at work and hope to develop a reputation among our colleagues that impacts our self-esteem. The final stage in Maslow's hierarchy of needs is self-actualization, which can be defined as having a keen sense of reality, viewing problems in terms of challenges, and feeling a sense of comfort relying on one's own experiences and judgment and having a sense of comfort with one oneself as well as accepting others and seeking peak experiences that leave a lasting impression. So when we're talking about career counseling theory, I think it's easiest if we get familiar with it by thinking of more and following more of a historical perspective of theories that have been developed and um, some of the reasons behind why those historical theories were developed. So today we're just going to cover this one, and that is trait and factor, which is the first career counseling theory. Trait refers to a characteristic of an individual that can be measured through testing. Factor refers to a characteristic required for a successful job performance. Frank Parsons, in 1909, wrote choosing a vocation, three steps. So step one, clearly understanding yourself, your attitudes, abilities, interests, ambitions, resources, limitations, and their causes. Step two, knowledge of the requirements and conditions of success advantages and disadvantages of that occupation, compensation, opportunities, skills required, demands, rewards, and prospects in different lines of work. And then three is true reasoning on the relations of those two groups of facts. Workers and employers are most satisfied when there is a good match between them and the between the characteristics of the worker and the characteristics of the occupation. When helping individuals make career decisions using trait and factor theory, there are five agreed upon traits, which are aptitudes, achievements, interests, values, and personality. Aptitude tests determine a person's probable future of uh, and future level of ability to perform a task. So in my old role at the University Career Center at Texas Tech, we did not offer any aptitude assessments. And that was because, uh, well, there were several reasons. But let me tell you about a story about the second day of work there. Um, I was in my second day on the job, and I just started. Uh, first full-time job, very excited about it. And I, along with the rest of the staff, at that day, we took the career scope, which is partly an interest inventory, but mostly an aptitude assessment. And this, it was uh, developed by the government, the career scope was. But after taking the assessment, my results indicated that I would be good, that I um, would be good at just things like clerical tasks rather than uh, 
other types of occupational skills. So it also said I should not seek occupations that required additional education requirements beyond that of an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree. And I had already received my PhD at that point. So I'm going to blame my poor performance on this aptitude assessment on the fact that I was nervous because it was my second day of working on the job. But um, after I received those results and some other colleagues received their results, we felt that if a young 18-year-old were to take that assessment and receive the results that I received, that that might make them not strive harder for occupations because of those results. So there we believed that interests were a better predictor of success because if a person is really interested in a subject, then they'll want to study and do the things necessary so that they can really be successful in that field versus necessarily having a natural aptitude for it. Um, so in fact, several studies have shown there is, uh, or have indicated, sorry, studies can't show, they can indicate uh, a small but significant correlation between interests and abilities. So. Achievement tests um, assess how much a person has learned, whether it be an academic accomplishment or an accomplishment at work. Examples of achievement tests would be your comprehensive exams that you take at the end of your master's program, as well as the national counseling exam, the NCE for licensed professional counselors. So that is a brief overview of trait and factor and we're gonna stop there for today. But next time, we'll cover more about um, the Hawthorne effect and John Holland's work. And um, so hopefully you'll tune in for the next video. Thank you.